My work has always been around homophobia, relationships, cultural context in the sense of religion as being an influence, government and politics also. My name is David Pavlosky and I'm a documentary filmmaker and I'm also the operations manager for the Department of Film and Media Studies at Hunter College. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Naturally, I consider you a product of love from me, Mom. And I can't treat you any different than the rest of my son, so. I wasn't about to abandon you and say, well, forget it and never call me because uh, I thought that the good Lord uh, wouldn't want me to be that. If I'm supposed to be a Christian person, uh, you certainly don't abandon any more than if you would have come home with a girl that was pregnant. Mm -hmm. We'd have made the most of it and did what we could. So. My first film, Don't Bring Scott, was about the difficulty my parents had in accepting my partner Scott as a family member. I come from a working class Catholic family in western Pennsylvania with four brothers, a very male dominated experience. And so when my brothers were getting married and being invited to wedding anniversaries and baby showers, I was being left out and I wanted to call that out. It's not that I didn't want Scott in my condominium, it's that I didn't want your lifestyle in my condominium. And what I mean by that is you didn't give me any terms as to how you two were going to behave because I have a niece and a nephew and they're going to say, well, gee, why is Uncle Dave and Scott sleeping together? Let me clear something for you right now. I don't condone homosexual behavior. I don't. I'm going to be straight up with you. But I will never judge you. There's someone else who's going to do that. I interviewed my whole family about the experience, so it's definitely a family piece. And uh, the end of that story is that my father ended up being very proud that I had done the film. And it really became the healing bridge in our family because the questions that I seemed to never be able to ask my father on a one-on-one, -on -one, when I was behind the camera, we were able to discuss things. It was a very unique experience because the camera became the catalyst for discussion, discussions that we could never have across a dinner table. We saw the front door open, we looked to see who it was, and there was an individual coming in dressed mostly in black. The ad asked me, is this the gay bar? I got up to just, you know, to watch the guys play pool, basically. He had said, this is where I want to be. So I said, okay, well, can I get you something to drink? And he said, sure, why not? He was pacing back and forth. They'd gone into the bathroom. And he was just standing right here. So I said, if somebody's that close to me, they must want to talk to me. I stopped, I looked, and... I turned to see what was going on. His eyes were really large, frantic and excited and terrorized. Right here is this hatchet coming into me. Tremendous pain. He had hit him over the head with a hatchet. This is bullshit. Puzzles When Hate Came to Town is about a hate crime that happened in New Bedford, Massachusetts. And Tammy got a call um, that, that we should go to New Bedford, Massachusetts immediately because a young man had attacked three men in a gay bar with a hatchet and a gun. And within 24 hours of that call, we uh, went to New Bedford and just started to shoot right away. Suspect Jacob Robita is right. still on the run at this hour. And as it turns out, there were actually three men shot in that bar. Two of them were also hit with that hatchet. I knew it was Jake. I've seen the hatchet before in his room. He's shown it to me. It's always been known that like, that's his favorite murder weapon. Jake didn't like Jews. He was a Nazi. Nazis don't like Jews. It's basically just how it goes. You had to like hang out with him and earn his respect. You know, he was racist and everything, so... You want to hang out with you, black, Puerto Rican, anything. Basically, you had to be white. After Tammy and I had finished the film Puzzles, which was a very violent film about a man that had been attacked with a hatchet and a gun, and also after my film Don't Bring Scott, which was a very emotional experience, I wanted to find humor, but I wanted to find how humor related to the LGBT community, and I just wanted to laugh in my life because there was a sadness in me from both those films in a way. How about gay comedy? Yeah, gay comedy. What the f is gay comedy? Some people wanna lock us up and throw away the key. They want
want to put us on a boat and ship us out to sea. If homosexuals are allowed their civil rights, then so would prostitutes or thieves or anyone else. I'm tired of arguing with idiots. I'm starting to agree. Their fascist plans beginning to make some sense to me. Homosexuality is a real threat to the survival of this country. So go ahead and put us on an island. <laughs> Hawaii, the Bahamas, or Key West. We'll have a lesbian, gay, and bi land. Lord knows we all deserve a rest. So my film, Stand Up, Stand Out, chronicles the history of the gay liberation movement of the 1970s and 80s, when the teachers' movement in San Francisco were denied their rights as teachers and actually asked to leave. And they fought back and said, we want our rights, we want to stand up for ourselves, and we want to be treated as equals. And so what came out of that were three men who created a club, a cabaret, where people could go express themselves, and most importantly, express themselves with humor. Because in their organizational work, they had a sense of humor that they would use to fight oppression. And Tom Amiano, who was a politician, but at the time was one of the first teachers to come out in the United States, said, I want to do stand-up comedy and I want us to have a place where we can commune and tell our stories and be heard and create an audience for our own humor, which we don't have. So it wasn't a gay bar behind dark windows back in that time. It was an open space of performance that said, bring our people in and let's be who we are and let's be that openly. I first came to San Francisco in 1962 in gay history that's post-hardware pre-boutique. <laughs> I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, God, I bet she's good in bed, huh? People say we're perverts. They say we are insane. They want to take away the rights we fought so hard to gain. How much of consideration are you going to give to the advice of these new conservative organizations and the moral majority and people like the Reverend Jerry Falwell? I'm not going to separate myself from the people who uh, elected us and, and sent us there. The battle is exhausting, it's a struggle all the way. So let's accept their offer, take a holiday. I don't know, I love these shoes. <laughs> is, is it okay to hate men but dress just like them? <laughs> I've always been an observer of life. I was pretty quiet as a child, and I was the person who would stand back on the fly on the wall and observe everybody. And that's became a very important foundation for my storytelling, observing human behavior, and then reflecting those stories through my documentaries. I recognize being funny could be uh, a tool, uh, you know, for lubricating social intercourse, so to speak. The right wing says they're against sex education because sex is a mere. 